Well, my name is Travis Doucette. I am thrilled to be here today with Graham Kendrick. Graham is often referred to by some as the grandfather of modern worship in the UK. He's the composer of hundreds of songs, most notably songs like The Servant King and Shine Jesus Shine. He's a teacher, a theologian, author, and practitioner on worship for over 40 years. Graham, it is great to be with you today. How are you doing, my friend? I'm very good, thank you. Yes, good to be speaking to you. And the one thing on that list I, I would kind of uh, qualify is the theologian. In, it's a very amateur you know, <laughs> thing. Um, and uh, I mean, I love theology and um, I've, I, I love listening to theologians, but I never had the opportunity to, to study it. So um, uh, just a qualification on that, on that label. That's Otherwise, great. people will take me to task. They'll say, you're yeah. supposed to be a theologian. How come you didn't know that? <laughs> well, watch this interview and suddenly you'll have a plethora of emails with theological questions about your songs. <laughs> well, this is real something special. I know before we hit the record button, I was able to share just a little bit of um, just how you've impacted my life as a worship pastor and worship leader, having grown up in Canada and uh, learning a lot of the songs that came with the March for Jesus. And that's something we're going to talk about a little bit later on. But Prior to becoming best known as a worship leader, you had like an extensive musical career in the 1970s and the 1980s. Can you help us understand what the landscape of worship music was in the UK during those decades and how you made that transition from singer songwriter to becoming a worship writer? Well, I think I just happened to be born at a time uh, when when I reached my teenage. Um, there was such a, a big cultural thing going on. It was the sixties, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, that changed culture in a massive way, and it and it began to. Um, I guess it was a new generation came up that just thought differently. Uh, we've been soaked in in all the new music, you know, the Beatles and and uh, the Rolling Stones and everything else that followed and Pink Floyd and oh, the list goes on and on. Um, at the same time, it was uh, there was a great decline certainly over here in the UK in church going. And part of that cultural revolution was a rejection of pretty well everything that came before, you know, anything which smacked of establishment. And the church, of course, qualified in that, you know, uh, in that sense. Um, so the churches were starting to drain of, of young people. And people like me, I know I was a pastor's kid, so I had to go to church, you know. Um, and actually, I, I did come to to faith very early as, as a young child mm. um but it put me uh this background is just to say all that because it put me in this kind of um moment of change when uh i grew up with the in a baptist church singing from the baptist hymn book but then on the ra on the transistor radio in the evening uh, i was listening to the beatles and all the all the regular music you know um, so I grew up in both those worlds, um, and if when people ask me what my influences are, um, I always say it's the Beatles and the Baptist hymn book, you know. Um, but obviously that era was the time when the time when the singer songwriter was sort of birthed, and um, I remember being a big fan of of uh, Paul Simon, you know, Simon and Garfunkel, and yeah. a whole lot of other names. Um, I remember just being uh, so songs that came out um, like Vincent, um, yeah. Starry, Starry Night, um, and uh, Don McLean or McLean, however you say it. And I remember being at college um, as on a teaching course, um, training to be a school teacher, and part of that was an art course. And I was in the pottery studio with a bunch of other folks, and someone had the radio on. And that song came on and we just stopped everything and gathered around the radio, you know, wow. and the same would happen like bridge over troubled water, you know, right. it was so fresh. I mean, it, that mu kind of music had never been heard before and it just touched a chord. So hmm. those big influences, I think, inspired me to start writing in more of a storytelling genre. Hmm. You know? Uh, as a teenager, I'd, I'd uh, uh, with my brother and sister and some friends, we formed a little band which played coffee bars and was a kind of testimony 
uh, you know, testimony songs. Sure. Um, um, and, you know, you'd sing a few songs and a preacher would get up and uh, give a five minute, you know, hard hitting gospel preach. And, you know, the band was the attraction. But, but then a, a few years later, I think it, it had become a lot more subtle. Um, so I started writing, sing, uh, when that band broke up, I had no one to write for except myself. <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of fell into it just because of the songwriting. Um, I, I didn't have a band, so if I didn't sing my songs, nobody would. I was pretty shy. I wasn't very confident in my voice, but um, somehow I started to get a bit of an audience. Um, and I guess that was starting to happen in the UK. Right. Um, and it, in some ways it was mirroring what had happened in the Jesus movement on the West Coast right. of the States, um, where, you know, people from the hippie movement got converted, a lot of them were musicians, and, and you had all those country rock bands, like Love Song and so on, emerging. And we were getting that, you know, it was arriving, um, and vinyl was being shipped over, and uh, we were listening to that stuff, and it kind of legitimized being a Christian artist. Mm. And, and that was the model I kind of followed. So fascinating. So Footsteps on the Water, that was the first one, right? Was that around 1971, 72? Uh, Footsteps on the Sea. Footsteps yeah. The sea. Um, so I, I, I got to get it exactly right. <laughs> You're talking to a lyrical perfectionist here. Right. Every, every word. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, while I was still at training college, um, uh, a young kind of startup record company um, called Key Records, some guys mm -hmm. who may be 10 years or so older than me, uh, who'd been in this kind of coffee bar band world. Yeah. Uh, but they'd started this record company and they heard some of my songs and gave me an opportunity to um, to record them um, pretty well live. You know, it was in a very nice studio, but it was uh, like a gap in a session. You know, so an American producer had come over to take advantage of the studio rates, I think, and brought one mm. of, uh, to inspirational singers because in those days it was the kind of bald-headed inspirational tenor that okay. was sent you know was 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 big and the american scene yeah so um i remember a producer came over and our our record company got to know him and so he gave us a you know a few little hours in in the wonderful london studios but you just had to sit down and do it you know there was no oh. tracking there was no anything unfortunately it was a kind of folky music so we had a a second guitarist and a string bass player. Okay. Um, and um, you know, you just kind of did it. You can you can hear it on the on the tracks. You can tell this is kind of rough and ready, but it has a certain charm about it. Uh, yeah. So what that song, uh, the the title track, um, "Footsteps on the Sea," a song called Simon's Song, was one of my very first kind of storytelling songs. Um, and it was Simon Peter, the fisherman, uh, being called on, on by the Sea of Galilee. Wow. Talk to me about the shift in your songwriting and, and your shift in, in your uh, musical career from singer-songwriter to, to worship writer, worship leader. And when would that have been taking place? As I look at your discography, it seems like it would have maybe been the, the early to mid-80s. Would that be accurate or was it happening even before then? It was, yeah, even before that. Um, so in the 70s, um, there was a, 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 a what you might call a spiritual renewal movement happening in the yeah. churches, just popping up here and there. And I started to come across people that talked about this new movement, talked about their experiences of being filled with the Holy Spirit and, and so on. And I looked at look, some of these guys I knew already, but they they're just like they glowed, you know, something had happened to them. Sure. And I, I thought, whatever you got, I want it. Where can I get that? You know? Yeah. So I ended up connecting with uh, that movement and um, starting my own journey in that kind of world. But one of the, one of the factors, in fact, the very first kind of house meeting I ended up in, um, and that's where, where these things were taking place. It was mostly in people's 
living rooms you know mm. uh, people would gather um it wasn't really accepted in, in the in the mainline churches and you know a bunch of people would sit around um it might only be half a dozen people or 10 people or something um and then they'd start singing these very simple worship songs mm. um and uh, so, some of those have kind of survived to to this day but they were they were kind of simple love songs you know father we yeah. love you worship and adore you glorify your name and all the earth or, um and or, or little kind of fellowship songs like we are one in the spirit we are yeah. one in the spirit we are because this thing was happening and it was like um people were trying to rediscover their roots you know the roots of the christian faith you know yeah. just a bunch of simple believers um and um so i remember being in those simple house meetings um and this the singing of those simple songs it wasn't kind of like campfire thing let's have a hearty sing-along you know right. it was let's worship god and receive you know yeah. whatever god is doing mm. um the song kind of glued those meetings together and you'd sing a song many many times over and of course people outside of that situation or experience would say why are you sing those songs 50 times or something you know and you say we'll just go deeper every time you know yeah. Yeah. something yeah. was happening sure um so those movements started to grow and grow through the 70s mm -hmm. and and quite quickly were becoming quite significant movements and getting their own buildings and and uh, and so yeah. on and within those movements um people started to express uh, what was happening in, in songs you know mm -hmm. people who didn't have any background necessarily in in in, in music uh, but i was still pursuing uh the um call it a career but it it, it wasn't it was very much a kind of outreach mm -hmm. ministry kind of thing you know we were going to schools and colleges and singing our songs and trying to get conversations going and 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 so on but i'd started making albums and which some of which have become quite popular um but now and again towards the end of the 70s i would in the little team i was traveling with um i'd write a song you know and it might be just because one of the team was going through something and i it was like a way of praying for them or i remember one particular uh time when there was a lot of attention within the little 10 or so of us traveling and that's bound to happen you know Absolutely. strong personalities yeah. and you know you come to you're about to go into a meeting and you say let's pray together and then you could kind of cut the atmosphere with a knife yeah you know because it was like somebody fallen out with somebody else and was angry with so and so and i remember sitting there thinking kind of turning a prayer into a song and it, it turned, it came out, Jesus stand among us um, at the meeting of our lives, be our sweet agreement at the meeting of our mm. lives. Jesus, we love you, so we gather here, join our hearts in unity and take away our fear. So I sang it in our little group, and I think it helped us get a perspective on, okay, this is what it's all about. It's, <laughs> it's about Jesus standing among us. But of course, we were working with churches, the host churches of our little traveling ministry team, so I would use those songs there, you know, mm -hmm. and then they kind of get passed from uh, by word of mouth and the amazing technology of the of the time, which was the overhead projector, um, where suddenly you could instantly um, put up a, a new song. You didn't have to wait 25 years to the next edition of the hymn, hymn book, you know, or till someone printed a compilation. Uh, you could just do it. And then people would watch you, your chords and come up to you I should say, I wrote down the words off the screen, but what was that chord on line four, you know? So my early worship songs just kind of traveled like and was happening to a number of other people as well in the UK. I'm sure in other parts of the world. It was a kind of grassroots grapevine thing that was happening. Mm. Um, and songs were traveling the world like that you know we were picking yeah. up songs from new zealand or you know um 
from various parts of, of the USA. Um, but towards the latter end of the um, 70s, mm -hmm. um, some some of these same guys I spoke of before that in, it launched that first record company in about 1969 or 70, mm -hmm. they identified that these songs were coming out and they started to gather them and mm. uh, and do a songbook called songs of fellowship right which went on to become a you know a big, yeah. big 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 seller but i was still making ccm records for want of a better description we didn't call it that then but you know what i mean mm -hmm. And then the uh, the guy who ran the record company discovered that I'd also been writing these other songs. So he said, "You should record those." And I thought, "No, no, I'm a, I'm a performer, you know. I'm a singer songwriter artist, you know. I I just I think it probably felt like slightly blow my, you know, sure. <laughs> below me to do. Although I was part of this worship movement, you know, I didn't see my, I, you know, the 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 role of a worship leader was still emerging in the way mm. that we understand mm. it um so but anyway i i agreed and so and i think in 1978 i made my contemporary ccm album and mm. also made a worship album called jesus stand among us wow. um which was one of the very first worship albums wow um, in in the uk wow. um, i didn't know that that's amazing hmm. well, what would you say graham was the first song uh worship song that you wrote that got traction and that had maybe uh, more than a local uh uh audience but maybe a regional audience like huh people keep writing in and they're asking about was it that song jesus stand among us yeah it, that was that was one of us the, there was there was a handful um of songs but it was interesting what was happening at that time. Um, I, after that little traveling team, um, the guy who led it uh, was a very um, entrepreneurial kind of character, and he got recruited to head up um, Youth for Christ in the UK. Mm -hmm. And he was only like 26 years old. Um, and Youth for Christ was fairly small, but it, you know, it needed somebody to kind of grow it, and and I. We, we had a, a kind of preacher singer um, thing going, you know, we, we, we did a lot of stuff where I would sing and he would preach and it was really, really effective. Mm -hmm. So I stuck with him. Um, so Youth for Christ suddenly grew. I created the music department to try and gather people to do this the same as I was because we were all very isolated doing our own mm -hmm. thing in different pockets and it was quite new not very well understood people got a lot of criticism sure. um, on the you know contemporary music side um but he uh clive his name was clive calver um he got together with another guy and they conceived this idea of a um of a kind of week-long festival mm -hmm. um it's kind of woodstock with seminars i guess you call it. it was because that you know that era was it, it was we were still in the in in the glow if if you like of that sort of yeah. thing of rock festivals and and it was right. very cool and one or two have been started but you know being involved in as he was and as i was in helping the church equipping the church to evangelize and to reach out yeah those ways um felt that something more was needed than festivals and concerts you know which were very popular at the time so they conceived something um an easter event a residential event um, mm. um on a kind of uh, holiday holiday um resort site um called spring harvest and so it started with about three thousand people um young people mm. um and I remember it was still trying to find its identity and we had a lot of bands who were playing. So it was a little bit like a festival okay. with bands plus seminars. But I remember one evening Clive came to me and said, look, we've got a bit of a problem. Um, we've got these bands lined up tonight and, and you're due to play your set. Mm -hmm. But the people are getting frustrated because they want to worship, you know? Mm -hmm. They love these bands they're great bands but something is happening 
people um, are wanting to worship in this more engaged kind of overflow of the heart kind of way, you mm -hmm. know. Um, would you mind, Graham, if you instead of doing your set, you lead you lead some worship songs, you know, so mm -hmm. I gulped a little bit because um, that was all very precious to me doing my <laughs> my my, my uh, singer songwriter set, you know, but I could see it was right. Um, and for me, that was a moment because there was such a response, and especially to the new songs which were mm. coming through, and I had a handful of them at that time. And it kind of began um, to pivot me towards uh, that side of things. Um, and within about four years, um, uh, four or five years, uh, the concert side have been displaced by the worship leading. Yeah. Nobody wanted to go to concerts anymore. They wanted to have a worship evening in their town, you know? Yeah. And this new sound and this new way of leading worship, um, you had to ship someone in because it was like it was a new thing. And there right. was only a handful of people are doing it, you know? Um, so we were kept pretty busy um myself and and others doing the similar thing around the country and then similar similar bible weeks and uh you know conferences and so on were growing with these new movements so there was yeah. a a wave there was a whole wave on which and songs were were expressing that new thing that which was happening and giving it more energy if you like singing about what god was doing yeah songs that have come out of the hearts of the people who are part mm -hmm. of this new, new new movement i love that it seems like anytime that there's a move of god that new songs follow and um you know i think of you kind of refer to it like the jesus movement so you got chuck smith and calvary chapel and you have maranatha music coming out of that in the late 60s and early 70s and then you have John Wimber teaching the Signs and Wonders course at Fuller Theological Seminary and that giving birth to the Vineyard Movement. And now the outpouring of music that came through that. And then, you know, a number of years later after that, obviously, Integrity Music, another gather of songs. And then you have David and Dale Garrett in New Zealand yes. in scripture and songs, mm -hmm. gathering songs, and, uh, and just even that, you know, influencing. And, and back in the day, the Houstons, Frank Houston being in New Zealand, who would later go... To, to Australia and Brian and Bobby and Hillsong Church, you can just see there's something that happened in the 70s mm. that laid the groundwork for all of this. Mm. And, um, you know, as you're well aware, you know, I, you know, people like Matt Redman and Martin Smith, who are the people that I cut my teeth on when I was a teenager, um, they point to you. They point to you as, as someone that they were listening to, that they were learning how to lead worship from. Mm. And, uh, and obviously, uh, you know, that all ties back to what God was doing in the 70s. Um, let's talk for a second about Kingsway music, because I know you've been with many labels, but Kingsway was was a big part. It seems as though Kingsway predate, predates integrity um, out in the UK, and it was not only, um, it, it seemed to be not only a label, but a distributor. It's a, as I look in discographies, um, even some er, early Larry Norman albums were released through Kingsway um, out in the UK. Can you share with us your involvement uh, with Kingsway, what their mission and their platform was, and um, how they would platform artists that would become part of that genre of Christian and worship music in the UK? Yes. Um, so I kind of, my relationships, relationships, I had kind of tracked a whole lot of that because uh, the guy who was behind the uh, key records, which was the 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 company that uh, enabled me to make my very first sing songwriter album in about 1971 i think it was um so within a, a few years he reached a point where um uh, they needed distribution you mm. know? and there was a a book publisher called kingsway music um and it was a uh, the way I've heard it told is is it was a kind of a coming together, one of those serendipity moments, you know. Um, Jeff Sherm was the guy who uh, who was the heading up the record company that I was involved in in those very early years. And somebody else, you know, said, oh, you should talk to Kingsway because, you know, 
they've got this, but they need more um, of this, you know? And they came together, became one company, um, and that gave them, because uh, Kingsway was a, uh, was a very successful uh, book you know, just, mm. I mean, they're just been books and there's loads of bookshops around the country. That was the day of the bookshops. Oh. And now suddenly they have music as well. Um, so they, yeah, they were in a position both to import and to initiate new local, you know, um, recordings uh, as, as well. Um, so they grew up with this whole movement. And a lot of the guys in Kingsway Music um, were heavily influenced by this new renewal movement in the churches um, and were able to kind of make 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 the right bridges, you know. Um, and uh, there was there was the beginnings of doing very simple recordings um, mm -hmm. in some of these Bible weeks. Mm -hmm. um, but the the standards were so were so poor. You'd hear more people bashing tambourines and talking to their friends um, than you know than the music. But you know the atmosphere was great. But there was no expertise really to re record it. And so <clears throat> um, Jeff uh, Jeff Schoen, uh spoke to a, a young um, sound engineer becoming a producer called Les Moyer. Uh, I know that name. <laughs> yeah. And um, Les actually engineered on my very first 1978 Jesus Stand Among Us album. Oh, wow. It's all connected. <laughs> it all, it's all, it's, I mean, there's so much to do with the relationships. It re really is. Oh. It's, it's the real key to all of, all of this, relationships and trust and growing together and, and, and so on. But... Um, so Jeff had a meeting with Les. And I heard this from, from Les's lips recently, <laughs> from the horse's mouth. And uh, Jeff played him uh, one of the recordings uh, from one of these British Bible weeks with all its excitement and participation and terrible recording standards. <laughs> And uh, that we would say these days, um, and also then he played him um, a Maranatha uh, music record, um, which was kind of church songs. It hadn't quite reached the. Um, it it sounded a, a little bit um, stu too too studio, you yeah. know. Um, it didn't quite have the life, you know. So he said to um, to Les, "Can you give me the best of both mm. those things? Can you record, you know, a whole bunch of songs that where the quality is as good as the Maranatha, but the atmosphere and anointing, if you like, you know, is like these Bible weeks where thousands of people are just." ecstatic you know <laughs> singing their hearts out uh, and that really i suppose define i'm talking about someone else now but that very much defined les's role uh, but of course you know very soon what you know some of the first projects he did uh in that with that aim uh were with me um so it was and that was always the challenge how do you keep the recording standards high, you know, and the musical standards high, but capture the moment as well? It was really interesting, Graham, hearing you talk about how, um, you know, what was happening in the UK and, and just the desire to capture the live worship setting, but making sure that it was like a high quality recording as well. Because as I've interviewed a lot of people from Integrity, Tom Brooks, um, Gary Gustafson, who I know you know well, um, that is the exact same thing that was really undergirding Integrity's mission mm -hmm. as well, to capture yeah. the anointing yeah. and the expressiveness of a worship gathering while bringing the quality of a recording up. And even as you talk to historians who have done uh, history on the uh, 
the historical background of praise and worship music, uh, you know, their earliest exhibits are these cassette tapes that are exactly that. They're just, you know, they would circulate because they would have a chorus on it and people would try to figure out what song and what the chords are, but the recordings themselves were, were just substandard to, you know, what we would have today. But um, on the backdrop of all of that, um, what was your first introduction to Integrity Music uh, and who were the key people that you were first introduced from that organization and how did God even open up the opportunity for you to work with them? Well, you know, I was a beneficiary of uh, the guy I mentioned earlier, Jeff Schoen, um, who was running Kingsway Music. Uh, the fact that he was making trips to the States and he was, uh, while I was buzzing around doing events here and there in the UK, uh, mostly, um, He's, he was crossing the Atlantic quite a bit, um, and he started to uh, connect with some of these movements. And I think so, I guess he had two, um, two, two streams to flow now. One was the whole uh, music um, distribution album, you know, the industry side, because he was part of a company that was importing, mm -hmm. you know, sure. uh, stuff, but also being connected with some of these new church movements, um, you know, he would find his way um, to some of the churches that were writing new music and so on. So really, it was it was it was Jeff that um, came across Hosanna, um, as it was called at the time, you yeah. know, that Hosanna music before it became called Integrity. Um, and he was he was very excited about um, the way they were going to churches that were writing new songs and had a lively music ministry and you know recording them and and then a bi-monthly uh club for these cassette tapes right subscription club. The, i'm sure that the um the businessman side of him thought this is great you can sell a new cassette every eight weeks or something like that um if you can find the original stuff of course but um uh, and um so he discovered of, uh, that integrity had developed this pattern of having the main worship leader in one of these worshiping churches mm -hmm. being the kind of host worship leader yeah um, and uh, so they they do that just you know for that one project and maybe uh, if they had songs, their own songs could be on there, mm -hmm. um, but songs from their church. Um, and this seemed to be working for them, you know, because it became all about the songs, not just about an artist mm. and whether or not they were writing good songs in that particular year or, or not, as tends to happen with more the artist kind of thing, you know. And that, what you're saying right now, I think is really worth pausing just because we live in such, and, and it's hard for like a 20 something year old to even understand this because we live in such an image based culture mm -hmm. with even in the worship music industry, like why is it even an industry? We, we have, we have, um, you know, personalities and even those early Hosanna tapes, your picture wasn't on the front cover. And it truly yeah. was all about the song. Your credit was, you know, this little line with how many ever characters it takes to spell Graham Kendrick on the back, and that's it. Yeah. And and it's hard for us, you know, from other generations to even imagine a world like that. But that was the, mm -hmm. you know, the infancy or the toddler years of the praise and worship movement. Yeah, yeah. It, it was very much about about the songs. It was very much about the church movements uh, uh, and what was happening um, w within them. Um, and I you know what I described in the 70s, uh, these renewal movements, uh, I say it really wasn't about praise and worship. Mm. It was God's at work, the Holy Spirit's doing things. He's renewing some of those um, things that we, you know, happen in the early church. We, you know, there's, there's, that's what we hope is happening. And it was about, um personal renewal and communal you know being becoming a community there were quite a lot of songs there about um being part of the body of christ and, mm -hmm. and loving one another because that was what god was doing so the songs were just uh over 
overflows of what was hap of what was happening. So, um, you know, it was for me, I guess that Lamb of God uh, was an opportunity, um, but it was part of this making connections. Mm. And I think also in their minds, um, in the minds of the of the in the publishers and so on, they're thinking, well, I wonder if this can cross the Atlantic. You know, I wonder if because actually uh, it reminds me, I think one of the issues was uh, in terms of bringing what Integrity Music was recording over to the UK. With all due respect, the American accent was a little bit of an issue for interesting. Lovely interesting. as it is. Only because the um, the reverse of that, I, I can never really tell, not never, but I do hear your accent when you sing, but I would say that there are some British people that it depends on the, it depends on the words that they're saying in the song and it doesn't, yeah. it doesn't come through. So it's interesting that a British yeah. perspective is that, no, we can definitely hear when it's American. That's yeah. fascinating. Yeah, yeah. Um, and also the, the, the American worship leaders uh, maybe were becoming known in their USA movements, but they weren't known over here. So to have someone like myself who was uh, becoming well known in the UK mm -hmm. to be the lead, the worship leader of, of this project, which was recorded at a church somewhere in the States. Mm -hmm. So that, that helped to introduce, um, and it worked. I think people were more ready to listen to this music because they heard a familiar voice or saw a familiar name at the bottom. And just so that people understand what we're talking about. So 1988, Integrity approaches you to record this, this project called Lamb of God, named after the Twyla Paris song, which was a monster song from our Kingdom Seekers project in the early 80s. The same project was released to the American audience a year earlier with a guy named Jim Gilbert as worship leader. Right. Yeah. So can you help us understand how Integrity approached you? And, and, and like, how does that conversation go? Do you want to overdub your voice over this already completed project like you're you're an artist you you're 15 you know years into your artistry as a career and you're basically being approached to like do karaoke worship ram yeah. um, you know so like tell us about how that all came to be and why um i do remember feeling that some of the music style was a little bit uh, for for the for English ears, it was a little bit overblown, you know. It was a little bit, and of course, you got the Liberty Bell comes down, you know, in there. You got that. You got that kind of best of American semi choral, you know, with a pop vibe to it. Um, and you know, I wasn't entirely um, into that, but at the same time. I was aware that there was a global movement happening and it was exciting to be part of it. Mm. And they did put one of my songs on there. So I think that was probably, ah, okay. probably yeah, a little bit of a, a song called Rejoice. Um, and uh, so, you know, the, there was there was a two way traffic there. Right. Um, but I think there was also this sense um, that if it worked, um there would be more transatlantic right almost kind of like a test project now yeah. that song yeah. that song rejoice that rejoice rejoice christ is in you that's, that's it yeah. 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 yeah amazing amazing so it, it obviously worked um because they would come back to you and and we'll talk about amazing love in just a second but before we do that i just wanted to take a quick second i got some uh some audio here pulled up okay. um and uh, I want to play a couple of songs, so I want to I want to get I want to get one of these songs ready here. Um, but before I play it, um, it, it just seems like the 1980s were a real prolific time for you as a songwriter, as a worship songwriter. Mm -hmm. In the back end of the decade, you composed a handful of songs that not only went around the globe, but that still stick to the wall today. So let the flame burn brighter, the servant king, O Lord, your tenderness, meekness and majesty, and of course shine jesus shine kaboom a monster song um what was god doing in you as a songwriter that gave way to such an extensive concentrated body 
of work that has endured for so long? Well, wow, um, that's a very, a very good question. Um, I mean, certainly, it was a very busy time. In fact, in the very beginning of the 80s, um, I was <laughs> doing some interesting things. I was I was touring with a mime artist here in the UK. All right. <laughs> what? what? <laughs> and uh, because mime was cool for you know, a, sh a short period oh, of time. The Graham yeah. Kennedy I never knew. Travel yeah, yeah. from mime artist. And I was writing, um, uh, you know, songs that you could... Uh, you could go. mime to. <laughs> no, I, I wasn't one, you know, I didn't mime, uh, <laughs> thankfully. Uh, but a guy called Jeffrey Stevenson, who I've met um, who uh, uh, up in York in the UK, um, I moved to a church up there and we connected and we just saw the potential for because a lot of my songs, uh, my solo songs, if you like, are quite descriptive, quite mm -hmm. graphic. And um, so he would mime to some of the songs as he'd do a complete silent mime himself. And it really went down a storm in universities and colleges. And it was just a great way to get people talking about Jesus, you mm, know, and it kind that. of slipped through all the cultural barriers, mm. you know. Um, and but at the same time, I was writing songs for uh, a Scottish lady called Sheila Walsh. Yes. Yeah. Um, who um, then became quite popular in, in America and the CCM yeah. scene and then became a, you know, TV presenter to this very day and still singing her songs and she'd been part of youth for christ in the uk mm -hmm. way back in the in the 70s and um although she's younger than me i'd point that out for, <laughs> <laughs> for her comfort for your comfort sheila um and uh but there was a period in like 1981 82 when she recorded i don't know must have been eight or ten of my songs on album after album mm. you know um so there was that side of things um mm -hmm. which coincided with some of my earlier praise and worship writing so i was doing the two side by side but i think one of the key moments was uh, in 1984 i moved down from york where i've been with an excellent um anglican church there which was very creative in lots of different ways in the arts and, and music and dance and so on um and part of this new neural movement within the Anglican Church. But yeah. I went down to London, moved my family down, and joined a church called the Ichthus Christian Fellowship, um, which was uh, just beginning to plant churches. It was, you know, an early example, certainly in the UK, of a church that starts, you know, grows and then starts other churches and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and... I arrived at just just a perfect time um, because there was some excellent Bible teaching. Uh, Roger Forster, uh, very very intelligent. He'd been a kind of travelling apologetics preacher, you know, and and now he was trying to do church, um, and he'd teach. You'd have training courses, and they'd teach children in the morning and then the afternoon. You'd have to go out and do it, you know. It was very hands-on. Social action was happening. Mission uh, to uh, ends of the earth. Mm -hmm. Local. Uh, oh, it was just a kind of, f for the church of that time, it was multifaceted in an unusual way. Mm -hmm. um, and I found myself in the middle of that listening to and it was fast becoming a movement mm. a movement which people came to see what's happening there and how do you do this and mm -hmm. and it was a season where i would listen to roger preaching and we had some other <clears throat> really excellent preachers and teachers in the church and i would be writing songs mm. you know, constantly mm. out of what was happening and what i was hearing and the vision particularly the vision for uh, the Gospels of the ends of the earth. And and um, so I, in many ways, I kind of became um, a, 
you know, somebody, I wasn't just writing my own songs. I was, mm -hmm. I was writing the church's song, you know? Um, love that. I love that. And you mentioned Sheila Walsh and I'm just curious to know, like having written for, did you ever find yourself in proximity to, uh, Cliff Richard or Larry Norman? Cause I know that Larry did a few things with her very early. Yeah. Okay. And I wasn't sure, were you running in those circles at all or in, engaging with those people at all? Yeah, yeah, definitely. In you know, if you like intersecting uh, sure. with them, and Larry Norman came over quite often to the UK, and um, we'd sometimes be involved in the same events, um, and um, and you know, folks like Randy Stonehill as well. You know, I remember doing a little coffee bar with you know he and I were the artists in this little coffee bar somewhere in London. Um, and very, very interesting days. Uh, and Cliff, of course, you know, being the, the, the guy who was a big, big star sure. in the UK as a, you know, pop star. Yeah. Uh, who had, had um, was very open about his faith as a Christian. <clears throat> um, and he, yeah, collaborated on quite a number of things with, with Sheila. And, um, and he's, yeah, and used one or two of my songs uh, as well. Um, as time went by. Um, so that was quite exciting, um, exciting time. Certainly exciting for me as a, as a songwriter, you know, right. there was songs I used to sing um, with just my acoustic guitar, you know, and then suddenly they'd be on a stage up there with Cliff Richards and Sheila Walsh or whatever singing. I don't think Larry Norman ever sang any of my songs. He, he was, very much so, so particular so um no what i mean is so such a unique mm. you know kind of uh artist you know right very much had his own his uh, own voice you know to yeah. sing his own songs yes <clears throat> so that was um it it, the, it was an exciting if not busy and pressured time <laughs> i can see based on the body of work that was composed during that now i have to ask as a canadian uh, were you ever exposed to, or did you ever listen to Bruce Colburn? Yes, yes, I did, and he did come over. I, n I never met him, right? Uh, but I remember seeing him at uh, festivals like Greenbelt, and um, yeah, when I friends, think, yeah, who were very much into his his music. Yeah. His 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 seventies output definitely had some, uh, you know, Christian themes intertwined, and there was a, a record that he did in. 79 called Dancing in the Dragon's Jaws that I remember my dad putting on the turntable and just being enthralled by his guitar playing. And he came to mind because when I was hearing you describe your playing and your output from the 70s, I'm like, yeah, it's kind of in that Bruce Coburn singer, songwriter, acoustic, folky category. So he was someone that came to mind. Um, I want us to listen to uh, a song that you, uh, that you wrote during this busy time. Uh, this is uh, Let the Flame Burn Brighter. Let's listen to a clip of this here. Graham, I love that song, and I have so many um, memories as a young young kid singing that. But um, man, just what an anthematic melody! Um, you know, I think of I think of the melodies of your songs, and I think of how not only singable they are, but how familiar they feel almost instantaneously. 
and and just that you know Garrett Gustafson talks about how you know great worship songs are portable songs they're ones that you can put in your pocket and take with you yeah and yeah. and and songs like let the flame burn brighter are just like songs that you can hear once they're they're uh you know easy to learn but difficult to forget and uh that's definitely one that um <laughs> when I remember us singing, what do you remember about that song? Well, you know, it it came as a part of this wave um, of what became known as March for Jesus, right? Um, and uh, some, you know, people may know that, or they may be able to speak to their ask their parents or grandparents about it. <laughs> but uh, it it was. I, I remember a, a point in the mid 80s um when i was part of this whole new praise and worship movement and there was a lot of arts expression as well the church was many churches becoming very joyful and musical and colorful and you know and i suddenly stopped and thought this is fantastic but it's all locked behind the four walls you know mm. uh how could this sound get out there and i just scratched my head and thought how do you get how could we take this on the streets, you know? Mm -hmm. And it became a, a kind of just something I couldn't shake, you know? Yeah. And in many ways, it went right against my comfort zones because I, you know, I'm the kind of guy who loves a controlled environment to play music in, you know? But the streets, you know, um, I'm an introvert, you know, I, I don't like that stuff, but I couldn't shake it. And the church I was part of in London, Exodus Christian Fellowship, was um, was was on the streets a lot. You know, it was part of our um, sort of distinctives that, that the church was not to be shut behind the walls. You know. Um, anyway, there's the whole story behind that. But I ended up um, writing a bunch of songs. Just to, actually, it was just like a 20 minute um, side B on a vinyl album sure. right you flip it over side b sure. um uh, side one was just a bunch of regular worship songs that i was right. putting out uh, new ones side b was a 20 minute praise march you know and it was designed churches you can learn this you can take it down your high street down your main street you know uh, get together with other churches just get on the streets and it was deliberately simple music so that had taken off from about 1986 mm. and and it just went exponential so uh and shine jesus shine was a, a part of that kind mm. of expression mm. when we come to a point where um we we really wanted to impact the culture um and we thought well let's let's see if we can get a single in mm. uh, in the charts mm -hmm um and because i was you know the the primary writer for uh, march for jesus it it fell to me uh to have a go <laughs> um and oh i i wrestled the rest with it and then finally we had a song somebody came across uh, a, a a record producer a christian guy who had had who was working at abbey road we managed to the famous Abbey Road Studios where the Beatles and everybody else recorded. So we got a few hours in squeeze between sessions in Abbey Road, got some singers in. Um, lovely guy called Jeff Shattuck, record producer, you know, took it on board um, and, and, and we did it. And um, it, it actually reached number 50 in the charts. It's it, awesome. Uh, in, <laughs> it just squeezed in it just squeezed in there but the point was this this movement that was happening sure you know? um and you know we would have uh a march through london f like fifty five thousand people you know um and then it grew you know and you would have seventy thousand people or or two hundred fifty thousand around different you know uh local areas and 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 it went europe wide and it went worldwide in 1992 so let the flame burn brighter was was a kind of step on the way another uh, song to try to capture 
the essence of that movement. And that's, and that's, well, it's like a manifesto, isn't it? It's we'll walk the land with hearts mm-hmm. on fire. Every step will be a prayer. You know, we're going to, we're going to pray the streets. But, yeah. But there's, there's that sense. There's also the kind of sense of like this, uh, like in the most appropriate way that like almost militant, like we're taking the land and, and, and there's, there's something, there's something, uh, um, Debbie Grafsman over here in, in, in the, in the United States writing songs like mighty warrior and songs of spiritual battle. Like there was, yeah. there was something, in the late 80s to do with spiritual warfare and public praise and taking the streets that is all coming up from the same well it seems yeah yeah now. yeah it, it it definitely definitely was i th- i think there was i don't know quite what it was the, there was an atmosphere particularly and i certainly felt it in the late in the late 70s um i did a whole album called fighter and it was mm. like a call to come on church you know we've got to get active i think it was still a time when there was a lot of nominal church going you know and it was time to say come on this is the gospel let's uh let's step up and step out and uh, be be open about our faith and share it with our friends and but at the same time i think a sense of i don't know perhaps even the background all those years of the cold war you know uh, you get this sense of a cloud. You yeah. know? I mean, I don't mean, actually, you know, one of my recurring nightmares, nightmares was the mushroom cloud. Sure. You know, I'm, I'm sure it's one of, sure. in the millions of young people at that sort of time, where at the back of your life, there was this fear of, you know, nuclear yeah. war um, yeah. or, or Russian invasion or something like that. And, um, um so i think there was there was an atmosphere um that made us take seriously you know the fact yeah this is a spiritual battle Mm. um and um and i think that did that definitely did um uh fuel a lot of a lot of songwriting um and all these things you know then debalancing out you know as time goes by you know you don't want to become too too focused on one on one thing um but certainly the 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 call to um uh you know to 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 follow jesus in a committed uh way and be like well you know paul told timothy to you know be a soldier a good soldier of christ not in the military sense but um to um in the sense of of not getting entangled with civilian affairs, you know, or like a farmer or like an athlete. It was one of those images of, of being totally committed to uh, a, a greater goal. It's good. I love, uh, I love too, you know, even listening to that rendition of Let the Flame Burn Brighter, the production has come full circle because I listen to some of the sequencing and the keyboard programming and I'm like, yep, that's kind of where we're at today. It's done the, <laughs> it's done the 30 year cycle and, uh, and all those beep, boop, 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 it's all back again and it's all uh, in vogue again. Let's listen to another one. Um, also kind of from that time uh, from March for Jesus. Um, let's take a listen to this. song big big song in my church growing up um you know and, and as a as an impatient seven or eight year old you're always kind of waiting for the worship leader man will they will they sing that great little bop and that was a, that was a great bop back in the day 
Graham, what, what has happened to antiphonal echo songs? We don't have them anymore. And you were like the, 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 the source of so many in the 80s. <laughs> but, but in all seriousness, can you speak to that? What has happened to antiphonal songs? Yeah. yeah. Isaiah 6, it's, it's there. The angels calling back and forth. Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Yeah. And, and it's, like, it's, it's like something that we've lost. That and the key change is like, has been dead since 1995. Yeah, the key change, yeah, and the diminished chord. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I think there were, there were two things. Um, one was the worship movement that I was a part of. I say that, it was just the guys, the people, the people I knew in the UK who were doing roughly what I was doing. We were very much into the Bible, trying to mine it for what it says about music and what it mm -hmm. says about praise and, you know, King David and his uh, Levites, you know, and all that he, he did. And, and uh, in the way that music releases the word of God, you know, like Elisha calling for a minstrel before he prophesied and, mm -hmm. you know, David playing before Saul and, you know, um, calming calming him in his in his psychological traumas or whatever was going on with, with him but um we would and of course part of all of that is yeah they sang antiphonally mm -hmm. um nehemiah when they were dedicating the the walls of the rebuilt walls of jerusalem he had two processions you know going one way and one the other way on the walls and they were calling to each other you know um and singing back and forwards, you know. And so we did it, number one, because it was biblical. I did it a lot because I was also writing songs for March for Jesus for right. the streets. And what works best, what's instant to learn? Call and response, you know? Very, almost primal, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, worship leader sings a line, everyone sings it back, instant participation you know yeah and i was looking for those kind of things but i was aware of the dynamic um which i tried to incorporate on in, in indoors as well and i remember one of my early worship songs was um the chorus went uh, you uh, you're alive you're alive you have risen Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And yet, you know, you divide the crowd into three lots and the hallelujah went sort of across. You know, <laughs> I love like it. Sort of musical Mexican wave. Um, and <laughs> the thing is, it, it to this very day, it brings a different dynamic. Mm. And I think, in fact, I, I did it... Um, at something I was at uh, at a festival recently and I had an hour in a prayer tent to lead and I was just improvising scripture, which I often do. So you know, let's just sing off the psalm, you know. And um, one of the things that fell into place was like one half of the room answering the other. And immediately we started that, there was a shift in the dynamic mm. because no longer people were, instead of being, you know, up to God, vertical, Mm -hmm. It was, you know, horizontal across the room. Ah, oh, there's other people here, communal. And I, I, I really think that we have lost the communal dimension of worship. Mm. And it's the culture. I don't think there's any question about it. Because we are in an individualistic culture where self-realization and how am I feeling? What's going on in me? It becomes so dominant. Sure. Those are the kind of songs we love because the culture has trained us to be, think about ourselves or just me and God, you know? But me and you don't even know you, you know? Or <laughs> <laughs> you and you, I don't sure I like you, or, you know? Um, I, I think in a, a healthy Christ, Christian community, there's got to be a relationship. I know it's difficult in big, big churches. You know, I'm very blessed to be in a a modest sized church, although it's fairly big compared to a lot of church in England. But you know, you really know people. You mm. see kids. You see the kids grow up. You see people get married. You go to funerals. 
you know you go to weddings you know you're a community and you want to see each other's faces and but even even here again i think we've because there's been so few communal songs flowing out of quality for years and years you know what do we sing you know you, we want to sing really good songs but if they're not available then we don't sing mm -hmm. sing uh, in that way mm -hmm. um so i'd love to see see it come back i'd also love to see other styles come back because i think we've got very um into a it's a very good groove in many ways yeah but you know a groove can become a rut and and i think where for example you, you get me going now <laughs> is where are the songs of joy mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. um uh where is where is joy in the church? Because you 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 rarely hear it. Everything is emotional intensity, mm. you know, which is great, but not all the time, you sure. know. Um, and we do, we do get some high praise, which is you know kind of the the warring, pro, you know, declaratory praise. Um, there's a fair bit of that, but there's not a whole lot of joy. Uh, except in churches which have perhaps more of an African or Caribbean tradition. Um, and uh, where, you know, you, you can find a lot of joy there. But in the church, you know, in the church stream, I've been most associated <clears throat> within the white churches. Um, you know, there's not a lot of joy. Um, and I, I mean, just hearing those the horn section going there, I, I, that, I mean, that was a wonderful era when, you know, I was able to take a band with me to, to festivals and we'd have a three or four piece horn section and some great players and all that joyful stuff that, um, that is hard to do any other way, really, you know, different other instruments. It, it brings it brings the music to life in another dimension. Yeah, it it's it certainly does. So I, I really hope the joy comes back. <laughs> well, I want to get back to um, some of the projects you did with Integrity Music. So in 1990, you recorded this best-selling project. I think it was the first project that Integrity had ever did across the pond in Britain uh, for the Hosanna Music series called Amazing Love. What are your recollections of preparing for? choosing the music for and recording that project live hazy quite <laughs> <laughs> busy time for you <laughs> sorry it was a busy time for you was it not the early 90s uh, it, it was a, a very busy season so um you know you don't get a lot of time to reflect but um I, I remember certainly have very clear memories of being up in, in, in Scotland with a, a great choir up there that had been recruited to, um, you know, to, to sing. The tracks were brought over from the States. Um, and um, uh, the, I remember singing with the choir live up in, up in Edinburgh. Um, and the choosing of the songs you know uh, there was a season where there was a lot of interaction i was making quite a few trips over to the states and having conversations with people um uh sometimes you know going to the um hosanna music offices or meeting them up somewhere or meeting up with tom brooks um who was the main you know one of the main producers uh, and so on I, I got I to gotta interject and say, I blame Tom Brooks for exasperating our ears with key changes. I think he was solely <laughs> responsible. His arrangements are solely responsible for why key changes are nada in the worship realm right now. I <laughs> joke with him all the time about that. <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah, and, and Amazing Love uh, album won't disappoint in that respect as well. <laughs> there. Um, but actually, it was amazing timing um, in terms of, you know, my song output as a, as a writer, because um, 
I was able to put forward um, five, I think it was five songs on that album, which is a <laughs> high proportion uh, for an integrity album. Because again, it was the same uh, arrangement. You know, you, you, are, uh, you are the guest worship leader and you receive your fee and, uh, and, and that's it. Um, but Amazing Love and Shine Jesus Shine uh, were, were on there. I can't remember what the others were. I don't have the... Uh, the Feast was on there, which I think you composed. Yes, yeah. That was the opening track. Um, yeah, Amazing Love, of course, a monster song over here. And, and this was the project. Uh, I'm sure that those who were in worship ministry maybe had exposure to some of your songs that had traveled across the pond. But would you not say that this was the record that brought broader um, exposure to your music ministry to America? Uh, absolutely, yeah. I think I think it did, and obviously when you've got, um, you know, amazing love became um, a, a a big song, but shine is a shine just topped it all really. Um, yeah, it, yeah, and uh, that's always going to, um, uh, you know, open open doors and opportunities and so on. Um, so it, it was it was. Um, uh, an excellent opportunity, you know, which I'm very grateful for. And also, I think to um, connect with those guys and their passion for for excellence. And, mm -hmm. and obviously, they are able to put their hands on lots of resources, um, and studios and arrangers. And, you know, I mean, America's so, so resourced. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there's been a blessing certainly over in the uk we were always struggling uh, and still do really it, you know it's it's a, it's a small nation and the resources are similarly you know small particularly for the you know the christian scene uh, so it was great to have top class uh, musicians and i remember being in the studio I, i'm not sure which album it was actually it might have been the crowning one but um with bass players like Abraham Laboreal yeah. On, yeah. on bass. Yeah. And, uh, I think it was only afterwards people told me how famous he was. I just yeah. was ignorant, really. But, uh, you know, you sit there in the studio and and um, suffer a little bit of imposter sy syndrome. You think, what am I, what am I doing? <laughs> I'm I'm me I've, been here. <laughs> I've written a few songs and there's all these, you know, great session musicians and and uh and a whole string orchestra you know somewhere <laughs> and you, it, just an amazing experience to do that great privilege yeah where was amazing love recorded well um the i'm not sure where the tracks were recorded. i was looking for a, a cd earlier but i couldn't i couldn't find um a copy with credits on it so I couldn't tell you where the tracks were recorded, but we certainly recorded um, the uh, the choir and the vocals up in up in Scotland. Uh, wonderful to give it that wonderful Scottish lilt. Well, you mentioned earlier just uh, songs of joy, and I want to play a track um, off of uh, "Amazing Love," not one that you wrote, but one that I think exemplifies. Um, of joy and one that really exemplifies scripture verbatim put to song. I remember learning so much scripture through the songs that you wrote because mm -hmm. you would write it often just verbatim right into the lyrics. So this is uh, this is a, an example of a joyful scripture verbatim song. This is Oh Magnify the Lord from the Amazing Love Project. Praise you, Lord. You're so good. Thank you, Lord, for filling up with so many good things. The Lord's been so good to us. Come on, let's sing about his goodness. Let's exalt his name together and all the world here. Thank you. 
So again, like just hard, hard not to hear. I have lots of thoughts. I have thoughts about, wow, that's definitely like a British guy being merged with like complete Americana worship for the time, <laughs> shouting, shouting out cues on top of this like heavily produced American sounding worship. But that's not the point I intended to make. Um, the point I intended to make is just joyful. You just can't listen to that. And, you know, I, I'll... I'll whistle that still today, and it sets your heart upon God. It's the word of word of Christ set to music. Who wrote? Do you remember who wrote that and where that song came from? Oh, it says you're muted. Sorry, you. <laughs> um, no, I, I don't remember who who wrote that. Actually, uh, I haven't revisited that album for quite a quite a while. I think I need to actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great trip. Well, I want to I want to play another song from that project. Um, and then, you know, I, I can't imagine how we could, you know, have this interview without talking about this song. But this is really, um, you know, so some some artists have like defining songs. And, and it's just like one, maybe two or three, you have probably 15 or 20 that defines you, but probably in the top three, I would I would suppose shine Jesus shine is one of those. And, and for those who um, who don't I, I got to tell you my 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 introduction to this song was summer camp and i don't know um i'm sure you know that songs take on like cultural attributes in their arrangements so we always loved participating with shine jesus shine i remember this even being like 10 or 12 years old because we get to that 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 channel that pre-course shine on me shine on me did they clap like that in the UK to it as well? Yeah, we tried to stop them, but they did, <laughs> they did it anyway. <laughs> that was like, and, and, as, and as a kid, learning to use your body in worship and wanting, you know, anything that was remotely yeah, yeah. interesting and participatory, that was, uh, I don't know where that, maybe you know, but I don't know where that little clap came from. No. That was no. like, that was in Shine Jesus Shine every time we yeah. sang it. And people just, I don't think that was ever on the recording. It was just no. people did it. And it, it, it came from the people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and I, I know with the band, as I traveled around, uh, if we led that song, um, the, the little joke was the band would count how many claps there were, you know, because some places could maybe fit like eight, eight in there, you know, and others <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Uh, let's um, let's have a little listen to uh, this is the I know this had been recorded prior but this is this is probably the version of the song that maybe people in America heard first um, at least through Hosea integrity so this is uh, this is shine Jesus shine. that's uh tom brooks having some fun at the end you know oh, going to town yeah. like oh i'll just add some little uh keep yeah. <laughs> some bops there but, but i think it's important for people to realize like before um before um what a beautiful name before how great is our god before shout to the lord shines jesus shine was just a monster you could not go to any church you could not go to any conference you could not go to any parachurch organization that had a moment of worship like this was this was the song that was sung everywhere and um you know god god put wind in the sails of this song in a mighty way what, what's the story behind it it was simple i mean when i wrote it it was another song mm -hmm. um 
in the midst of writing a lot of songs and and um definitely it's its genesis was in the london church i was a part of and i remember there was a there'd be themes running through the teaching and the preaching and the praying you know i remember a season where there was a theme of uh, god's light and holiness and you know being in god's presence and um and, and there's lots of scriptures connected with that but you know and, and even, even now i'm not sure which ones particularly were but there's that beautiful uh, scripture about are we with unveiled faces mm -hmm. um you know gazing on the lord and we're changed from glory into glory and there's this, this sense of gazing at, at at god and his and christ his glory <clears throat> and that being reflected out from us out in into the world you know but initially i just wrote the three verses <clears throat> excuse me more or less i'll just take a drink edit moment yeah so initially um i wrote the three verses um more as a kind of hymn style um song mm. and um and at that time um we'd have lots of worship celebrations going on and plenty of time and i get a chance to try out a song mm -hmm. and i remember trying out those three verses mm -hmm. um pretty much you know in the same form they are now and it was kind of oh so grand written another song you know it's um, <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> it, you know people were polite you know <laughs> but um i kind of came back i was thought yeah it's it's not there it's it and i just put it away which is a good thing to do sometimes as a songwriter you know mm -hmm. let it sit there for a while and a few people as and i had an inkling too and other people would say you know that needs a chorus you know not, not nice verses nice tune but kind of doesn't go anywhere you know um and with that in mind uh and I, I can't remember the circumstances particularly, except I was in my home in London, um, in the room that I used to uh, to write and running, you know, just going through the song. Um, <clears throat> and that phrase just came to mind, shine, Jesus, shine. You mm -hmm. know, um, I started singing it out and quite quickly that chorus shaped, shaped up. Um, and I remember feeling the kind of chills, you know, you, mm. you, um, which you get sometimes when you feel like you've, something is in that, you know, you, there's, yeah. there's definitely something special about that. Um, mm. But I had no idea um, that it was that special, you know? There were other songs I was more excited about at the time that I was writing I think because they were more, they, I don't know, they, they were, maybe I felt they were more creative or whatever. Uh, but yeah. it was only when we started singing the song um, and trying it out that bang, you know, it's just the way that people embraced it. And I think that is something you can't manufacture it. You know, you, you, you kind of have to, discover it or receive it you know but it's something that people were ready to sing you know um and it certainly fitted the the church i was part of and the movement and the whole missional reaching out um uh movement that i was part of you know jesus focused worship but it was the desire that he should be glorified in the whole earth, you know, mm. not just my worship in my, out of my relationship with God, which is fantastic, but also, you know, fill this land with the father's glory. You know, mm -hmm. I think, I think we come to a point with March for Jesus and everything where we suddenly began to feel that things were possible that didn't seem possible, maybe even right. five years before, you know, thought this is a movement, you know, this is taking off um and 
the wind seems to be behind it, the wind of the spirit. You know, we had this saying, we don't, although we had an office <clears throat> um, which ran for years running March for Jesus just for that annual day, and, mm -hmm. you know, um, 13 years. It, um, we, we quite truthfully said, you know, we don't so much run March for Jesus as run after it, mm -hmm. you know. And I think that was, that kind of said something about the season that we were in, um, that things were taking off and you'd have to run to keep up, keep mm -hmm. up with them. Mm -hmm. And I think Shine Jesus Shine as a song caught that moment and became a passionate prayer of people, not just in the UK or in America, but other countries as well. And sometimes mm -hmm. people from other countries of the world would say, this is like our, this is like our national anthem, you know, for the church in our nation, you know? Oh, it um, felt at the time. It, it felt, it felt like the national anthem for the evangelical church. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that was a remarkable, um, remarkable thing, but with an unremarkable beginning, mm. you know, just in the routine of, um, of trying to serve my local church and give expression to what we felt the Spirit of God was saying at that time. Um, and obviously the wider movement that we connected with. Um, and, uh, you know, God just graciously gifted, you know, gifted that, um, mm. gifted that song. Um, and actually one of my greatest delights to this day is, is the way that in the UK, it became established in schools. Um, and really? uh, yeah, um, obviously not every school sings, but we have a lot of um, Church of England schools in the country um, uh, where there is a, uh, you know, a Christian foundation to it. And, you know, and others where they just picked it up as a song. Um, and uh, so, you know, I constantly uh, meet children that mm. um, youngsters, you know, six, seven, eight, ten year olds, whatever, um, who absolutely love Shine Jesus Shine, just generation after generation. And, uh, it, you know, for many of them, it's going to be the only Jesus song they know. Mm. Um, and, you know, it, it's it's a seed, isn't it? It's it's a seed um and if you sing it and i love singing it as kids do um it's a very positive connection you know it's a very positive association mm. um yeah <laughs> i love that graham that song will outlive you and not many songwriters get to uh mm. the song that outlives them but I think a handful of your songs will outlive you, but that is definitely one of them. And I think that's real beautiful. Yeah. yeah. So um, a couple of years later, 1991, the Crown Hymn Project comes along, another project with integrity, uh, which for lack of better word, kind of felt like, again, the, the American, like you had done, you were doing records in the UK that were the soundtracks for March for Jesus and Crown Hymn felt as though it was like a compilation of like the March for Jesus music, um, maybe dialed up a notch uh, with American musicians and a caliber of recording. Is that, is that fair to say? And is that how you saw the project? Yes. Um, uh, by that time, um, March for Jesus uh, had taken off in America and, mm -hmm. and Canada in quite a big way. Um, uh, that all started in 1989 with uh, a um a worship conference to, at the anaheim vineyard yeah uh yeah there's an interesting backstory there of um you know john wimber having connected with the uk since the early uh what the late 70s late yeah, yeah, late 70s, yeah. early 80s um and um although a very very different it's like a a, a meeting of two very different kind of traditions, you know, the, the, the very intimate, quiet, you know, vineyard style. Mm -hmm. And we were 
uh, <laughs> militant mission, uh -huh. uh, high praise and, and, and so on. But it, but somehow it all married together. Anyway, yeah, it was launched at um, the Anaheim Vineyard in 1989. And there was a young guy in the crowd there who took it on and eventually became the national uh, director. So to cut a long story short, um, resources were needed. Sure. And if you can have a march, the music very much captured the atmosphere of the march and was the raw material, you know. Um, and so we 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 did we, we put together some of the best in consultation with the USA March for Jesus office that had been established. Um, we um, and then you know integrity um, uh, were poised to take it. Um, I did, there was a book at the same time um, um, about you know th there was I'd put out a book in the states before um, in the eighties um, called Worship as a Way of Life, yep. and there was and then we there was another book called Public Praise which told the March for Jesus story the story so far from the UK. Um, so there was a coming together, I think, of the USA, you know, Integrity Music Publishing, um, and um, you know this this movement, which was fast becoming international, and 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 the songs, <clears throat> and we yeah we wanted to resource. I certainly in those days I I looked on uh, albums as resources. Mm -hmm. You know, they weren't there to be a vehicle for my particular um um you know musical Artistry. tastes or, yeah. or or ambitions or whatever it was marshall jesus has taken off we've got to resource it and sometimes that was a pressure you know because there's always a hunger for new materials and something fresh you know sometimes you refresh an event with uh, fresh music you know, and it just puts out a message, which is an important message for people who are going to participate, you know, what's different this year. And, you know, not that it's an entertainment thing, but, you know, pe from a visionary point of view, what's the vision? What's the purpose? You know, and the songs tend to encapsulate that. Mm. Um, yeah, so so that's that's the, that was the background um, uh, from my perspective, too crown him and was it um was crown him a studio like live in the studio type project i know don moen was was involved with that one do you remember um i actually don't remember because there was uh there were quite a few projects you know and <laughs> happening in different studios and sure. and um almost too guy too much going on to really you know track it keep track of it yeah yeah no my my understanding i i just from listening to it because i know integrity would do these you know get a, cr cram a bunch of people in a in a studio a live choir to get a live worship feel with it without it actually not being recorded at a live service and um and yeah, the, like even today that the crown and project uh, it's recorded well it's like you mentioned all those top players you listen to it and you're like yeah i can hear there's a high production value on it. in fact i want to play my favorite song which i think again kind of exemplifies just um a very a very interesting familiar melody um but also with some interesting harmonic undertones with some of the guitar chords you use but this is this is my favorite song from uh crown and this is from the sun's rising All the Rising unto the sunset, Jesus our Lord shall be great in the earth, and all earth's kingdom shall be his dominion. All of creation shall sing of his word. Let every heart, every voice, every tongue.
really nice uh, string parts on that, and, and almost kind of like an Appalachian feel with the uh, you know with the uh, the guitars going there, and um, and, and just very memorable. I, I always say it, the church loves songs in six eight. You write you write a song in six eight time, and the church is just like. Whoa. <laughs> You know, it's, it's different. That's different. I, I don't know what's different about it, but I love it. And uh, so, uh, I mean, there were, there were other things, you know, around that time, like in Europe, there were some big mission conferences going mobile, you know, mobilizing young people into mission, you know, yeah. and I would use songs like that um, in, in these big, big gatherings of tens of thousands of people in, in Germany or Holland and you know, and we were singing about, you know, we're going to do this stuff, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think that's when I listen back, um, I hear, you know, I hear that it's, it's a movement singing about what we're doing and what we're going to do more of, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and it's, um, and I, and I often, you know, from time, well, from time to time, I do meet people who were young people at those events, you know, and they'll say, Oh, that was such an amazing time. You know, that was when I, God called me to, mm -hmm. you know, some far flung region of the earth. Uh, and we've been doing it for, you know, 25 years. And, you know, and you think, Whoa, what, you know, what a privilege to um, be leading worship of those, those sort of events, but also putting those kind of words in yes. people's mouths yes. that express yeah. what was already in their hearts. But yeah. you know, when it's in your mouth as well, uh, and, and there's a melody, it just helps to reinforce it and also bonds you with all the other people that are mm -hmm. part of this, uh, you know, a mission gathering or whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. That song uh, segues into the chorus uh, for this purpose. And I, and I, that's another song of yours. Uh, it's like, where, where are these songs these days? We need these and, and verbatim for this purpose, Christ was revealed to destroy the works of the evil one scripture verbatim Christ in us is overcome. So with gladness, we sing and welcome his kingdom in. And then again, <laughs> the antiphonal, like we've lost this antiphonal, but to say that in the more, in the moment over sin, he is conquered. Hallelujah. He is conquered over death, victorious over sickness, sickness. He is triumphed. Jesus reigns over all. Like those are just things that we need to sing on the backdrop of struggling yeah. with cancer on the backdrop of a marriage that's on the rocks on the backdrop yeah. of a prodigal son or daughter and we don't necessarily have those songs the way that we used to and we need more songs like that i think they come along now and again but um yeah i think i think certainly more scripture songs mm. um uh because as you say it, it is one of the most effective ways of memorizing. Totally. Scripture. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's true that um, Christians are perhaps less biblically literate than they would have been, you know, maybe in my youth or particularly in my parents' generation, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, where people would memorize whole chunks of scripture word for word or other cultures, you know. Um, uh, I remember being in one particular nation with an, 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 an orth, uh, with a background to an Orthodox church, and um, I was doing a little bit of speaking um, to this crowd of leadership, several hundred people who were sort of uh, kind of you know mature Christians, and I was going to read out Psalm 27. So I said to my translator, um, uh, "Could you read out Psalm 27?" Mm -hmm. And he announced the psalm. Everybody just Psalm twenty seven without looking at the wow. page. The whole room they knew the psalm. Yeah. One thing I mouth. ask is one thing I seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord to gaze in his temple. Yeah, that yeah. it's incredible. It's yeah. amazing. It's very rare. Where you know, is yeah. uh, to me then that was that was that was not long ago, maybe ten years ago or so. But um you know that's 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 one of those sort of traditions um that we could all do with learning from you know um church traditions <clears throat> and 
it is more of a liturgical background than mm. that particular tradition would have. But to actually be so familiar with the Psalms that you yeah. can just uh, do that. I'm not sure that how many of them they do. There's certainly Psalm 27. They, they, uh, they, they nailed it. <laughs> I've been sharing with my uh, the worship pastors that I, I coach at our church. I've been sharing with them the need to, um, to to always be asking the question: Where does your authority come from? And it doesn't come from the clever things you say, but you power into voltage when you when you incorporate the Word of God, and just even the lost art of calling people to worship. And, and using scripture to do that. So we're in a season right now where we're together as a staff team, we're memorizing 30 short Psalms, uh, calls to worship, little little passages out of the Psalms that are that we can tap into. Um, yeah. Just because uh, I, I, I just don't, I, I'm not convinced that what the church needs on a Sunday morning is a, hey, how's everyone doing? Are you glad to be here this morning? It has, it has its place, but that's not where the power is. Yeah. You know, if we if we don't tap into what it is, you know, Jesus says in Psalm 33 that we're to sing to the Lord. Let's do that. Let's sing to the Lord with everything we have this morning, you know, using the scripture as our authority. Anyway, I, I digress. I wanted to ask. A amen to amen to yeah. all, all that. <laughs> I wanted to ask you, Graham, was so you did these two projects with integrity. Was there a reason why further projects were not explored or why other projects didn't happen? Um, not that I know of. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I should know, shouldn't I? Really? <laughs> um, I certainly could. Um, yeah, it's one of those things I probably have to call call a few friends and uh, say what did happen back you know back then um but um i think there was there were a lot of shifts and changes going on and um <clears throat> maybe some of the relationships changed um that were you know providing the bridge um for what i was doing or uh no i i really i really don't know uh if there was a particular reason or just everybody you know moved off in different directions in their own thing and sometimes that's just what happens seasons yeah yeah seasons of life um you know take you in different directions 